By now, most of us have probably heard of nuclear fusion, the reaction that takes place in the sun. And more recently there have been several attempts to bring that phenomenon down to earth to produce electricity. If you haven't heard of nuclear fusion, let me give you a quick breakdown. It's the process of creating energy by fusing two atoms together. In stars this process is done with hydrogen for 99% of the time, and other, heavier elements closer to the death of the star. In the experiments done on Earth, hydrogen isotopes, deuterium and tritium are used, which make fusion much easier. While the Sun has the advantage of massive amounts of gravity, on Earth we need to find different ways to force the protons of the hydrogen atoms close enough together to bond into helium. To do so superheated plasma is spun in a circle, with several huge superconducting magnets encasing the plasma, to hold it in position, creating a donut-like shape. To attempt to give you a sense of scale, the ITER project in France uses approximately 10,000 tons of magnets to control the plasma. These magnets not only require massive amounts of electricity to function, but are also required to be cooled down to around 270 degrees Celsius, below zero. Right, so now that we have a good understanding of how nuclear fusion works, we can discuss the new proposal of them powering rockets. Clearly this concept is decades away from being even remotely possible, as energy profitable nuclear fusion still isn't possible, but it does solve some unique problems that are faced when propelling a rocket. First and foremost, it should be noted that if in the future this becomes possible, nuclear fusion propulsion likely wouldn't replace standard chemical propulsion as a means of getting the rocket into orbit. With what we know now, it wouldn't be practical, as an immense amount of force is required to achieve liftoff, and so much is already known about launching rockets into space with chemical propulsion. Once out of Earth's gravity, and in the vacuum of space, much more is possible. Nuclear fusion propulsion is a fairly ideal method of producing thrust, because unlike ion propulsion, nuclear fusion would be able to produce 5 to 10 times more thrust, while still retaining the ability to produce that energy fairly consistently. As we can see on this graph, ion thrusters can produce about 0.5 newtons or 0.05 kilograms of force, while fusion produces 5 to 10 newtons, or 0.5 to 1 kilogram of thrust. This is due to exhaust velocities reaching an estimated 10 million kilometers per second, much faster than ion propulsion, which has an exhaust speed of 50,000 kilometers per second. This means there is a lot of potential to accelerate rockets to much higher speeds, faster, dramatically reducing traveling time between destinations. Typical chemical-only spacecrafts reach about 40,000 km per hour, and with the aid of ion thrusters, that number is expected to rise to around 200,000 km per hour, though it is estimated fusion rockets could reach up to 320,000 km per hour. That means that fusion rockets could travel 8 times faster than traditional chemical-powered rockets. To put this into perspective, the travel time from Earth to Mars in a standard chemical-powered rocket is about 7 to 8 months. That same journey would only take 90 days in a fusion rocket. Another massive benefit of fusion is the specific energy of hydrogen. Today hydrogen is often used as the chemical that ignites and launches rockets into space, but it is also the element that is being fused together in nuclear fusion, so it would make sense that they produce a similar amount of energy, however that is not the case. When cooled to a liquid, and then combusted, hydrogen has a specific energy of 141.86 megajoules per kilogram, which is rather high, much higher than a similar rocket propellant, methane at 55.6 megajoules per kilogram. However when hydrogen, or in this case deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen undergoes fusion, the specific energy is a massive 337 million megajoules per kilogram. Now it is important to remember that a large chunk of that energy is needed to start the reaction by both turning on the electromagnets, and heating the plasma to a staggering 150 million degrees Celsius. Another thing to keep in mind is that hydrogen is extremely light, so one kilogram of it contains many more atoms than say methane. Though even with those things in mind, more than half a billion megajoules of energy is a lot more than 141 from hydrogen combustion. So, how would a fusion rocket actually work? It would likely have some sort of apparatus that would dispense a pellet of deuterium and tritium, the size of a sand grain into a large nozzle area. From their high-powered magnets, would provide the pressure needed to achieve nuclear fusion. The helium and extra neutron would exit the nozzle at 10 million kilometers per hour, thus accelerating the spacecraft very quickly. Though unlike chemical rockets, this reaction would provide a pulse of energy every few seconds, because of the nature of the system, as making it completely continuous would be difficult and not as efficient. While fusion-powered rockets have several key advantages to traditional methods of transportation, it is quite clearly not possible. First nuclear fusion as a form of energy has to become possible on Earth before anyone would think of putting it into a spacecraft. 
Furthermore, size is a big problem, as just the reactor in Eider is 830 cubic meters, and that does not include all the complex housing. Though, if and when Eider is successful, it is likely there will be some breakthroughs that will allow the compacting of such a large machine. However, the efficiency will have to be greatly increased, as nuclear fusion works much better on a larger scale. Nuclear fusion may be fairly close for on-Earth applications, it will probably be a while before any sort of nuclear fusion power rocket flies. However this is one of the most promising proposed plans for the future of spaceflight, and once achieved, will probably lead to significant breakthroughs in spaceflight technology. But for now, all we can do is wait.